All right, everybody, we're going to go ahead and get started. Thanks so much for being here today at our research um, seminar. My name is Cinnamon Moffat, and I'm the research program manager here at Oregon State University's Hatfield Marine Science Center. Uh, and I just, again, want to welcome you to our uh, event this afternoon. Um, for any new faces in the audience, I just want to remind you this is a hybrid event. So that means we have folks online and folks in the room. For folks online, if you have any questions or any technical issues, you can put those questions into the chat box. And our volunteer who's in the room with us, Roseanne, will help you navigate those questions. Um, and we'll read them out to today's speaker and we can get those answered that way. Um, we do have your mics, camera, and screen shares disabled for today's event. For folks in the room, uh, when we get to the question and answer at the end of today's presentation, if you raise your hand, I'll run around and bring you the mic. And that way the folks online can hear your question and we have more of an interactive uh, process that way. Um, so thank you again for being here. And um, I just want to do a couple of reminders here. Um, we have a fun uh, seminar next week. We have Fiona Thomas Nash, um, which several folks around here know works in those black tanks out by the um, CEL. She is going to be doing a talk that she is labeled No Sex When Stressed. Um, and so she is going to be talking about a widespread, unique reproductive behavior change for marine habit forming species um, after some of the large marine heat waves that we've been having. So that'll be a really interesting talk. So I'm excited for that. Um, and then I just wanted to let folks know that this event will be recorded. So if you have any questions or you want to share it with others, this will be posted on our past seminar page, um, probably by tomorrow afternoon. So feel free to share. Today's speaker. Um, is uh, somebody who works closely with somebody else that you all know, which is Jessica Miller. So Jessica is going to actually do our introduction for today. Thanks, Cinnamon. It's my pleasure today to introduce David Taylor, who is a postdoctoral scholar who joined uh, the Marine and Madrimus Fisheries Ecology Lab about seven months ago. And he didn't have to come too far because he got his PhD in integrative biology and he's used stabilized topes as a tool to explore and niche dynamics and trophic interactions across different environmental gradients. Um, and he's joined us to work with similar questions, but shifting to a marine system and to look at that in Pacific cod. And so we're happy to have him and excited to hear a combination, a, a, a truly a desert to the ocean talk today. Um, and before arriving, David got um, lots of education in Oregon. He a BS in biology with a chemistry minor from Southern Oregon University, plus a BS actually in fisheries and wildlife science from the department he's now working in, and then a, a graduate certificate in teaching, college teaching, and a PhD in integra integrative biology. Then he also spent a fair bit of time during COVID doing online um, and some in-person education with Lynn Benton and the Department of Integrative Biology. And I think his, his all of his um, experience in front of the classroom will show today um, as he tells you about what he's been working on. And um, he also has keen interests in equity and inclusion and has some really creative and uh, innovative ideas for how maybe we can advance that in the culture of academics. So if you're interested in that, you should chat with him. And when he's not unraveling secrets of the past, I know he likes to um, rollerblade and work on house projects. So if anybody likes to rollerblade, I think you might have a, a companion. So now he's going to uh, leverage stable isotopes to tell us about how we can assess species responses to changing environments. All right. Thank you. OK, sounds like I'm alive. Thank you so much, Jessica, for that wonderful introduction. I really appreciate it. Uh, and thank you all for being here uh, in person, online, and whoever watches this uh, as a recording later on. Um, I appreciate you being interested in my work. Um, so yes, as Jessica mentioned, we're going to be looking at how we've used stable isotopes to understand responses of species to environmental changes. Uh, and I'll talk to you both about terrestrial mammals and marine fishes today. Uh, so the mammal work uh, is work that I did during my PhD in the Terry lab. Uh, and the fish work is work that I'm doing now in Jessica's lab. There we go. Uh, so one of the key questions that we want to address when we start thinking about you know, when, when, when we're going to use isotopes is uh, how do species respond to environmental change? And we want to understand the different scales of interaction. Uh, so we're interested in both in, or in individual population and species scale 
interactions with the environment and how the environment influences the abundance and presence or absence of species in a landscape or an oceanscape for that matter. And so we're going to think about the interactions between climate and habitat, diet and biotic interactions at these different levels of individual population and species. So one of the sort of images we've probably all seen at some point in our education is something like this that illustrates this sort of growing complexity from individual to population and community. And so understanding the dynamics as we move from populations to communities of populations or of species and how those assemblages of species vary across larger landscapes and ecosystems becomes really important. And understanding those is a key uh, goal in ecology and a lot of the work we're doing here. And so here's an example everyone in this room is probably familiar with. Uh, kelp forests and these food webs. And in addition to being an iconic food web that uh, is you know, really typified by the, let's see if I have my laser on here. The, this keystone species, the sea otter, other important things to think about when we think about these types of interactions, these food webs, is that it's not all about the most charismatic species in the food web. Declines in all of the species can have similarly devastating impacts in these sort of networks of interactions. So how do we go about collecting the kind of information that tells us what's happening in these ecosystems? A lot of us probably get excited about the idea of going out into the field and handling the organisms, taking measurements of you know whether it's on a terrestrial system, the ground cover, or handling the animals themselves and measuring length and mass or working with museum specimens, but this isn't always possible. Sometimes the abundance of the species is limited and so finding it is difficult. Sometimes you're in difficult systems or sometimes you wanna look into the past. And so we have proxy measures for trying to understand environmental variability. Things like uh, Landsat data that can tell us about ground cover over large areas eDNA, which is getting DNA out of the environment to try and understand community compositions, or like what I'll talk about today, using stable isotope chemistry to try and understand food web dynamics and the movement of energy uh, and interactions through a community. I have a clicker in my hand and I'm not using it. <laughs> a lot of good it's doing me. Okay, so what is a stable isotope? And what do they do? Why do they matter for ecology? So isotopes are just atoms of an element whose nuclei have the same number of protons, but a different number of neutrons. So they have a slightly different mass. Uh, and I'm gonna be using these two pieces of notation today. So I just wanted to make it clear, this little uh, delta symbol is the symbol that we use to talk about isotopes. It's a ratio of ratios. That ratio is the number of heavy, isotopes relative to the number of light isotopes in the tissue or material we're looking at. Uh, so if you want to talk more about how we calculate all that, I'm happy to do that after the talk. So there are all sorts of different things we can measure stable isotopes in, and what we measure those isotopes in are going to tell us very different things about the system we're looking at. But I'm going to just hone in on a few uh, isotope systems today. Um, but to do that, I want to first give you a couple of definitions. This table has two words in it, bionomic, which is, think about it as the resources an organism is using, whether it's animal or plant, um, but we'll be talking about animals today, and xenopoetic. So these are the bioclimatic variables that uh, an organism is living in. Think of it as the bioclimatic envelope, perhaps, uh, for thinking terrestrially. And Today, I want to talk to you about four specific isotopes, carbon, nitrogen, hydrogen, and oxygen. In terrestrial systems, carbon and nitrogen are going to mostly tell us about the diet of an animal, carbon being C3 or C4 plants. A C3 plant is one whose photosynthetic pathway makes a three-carbon molecule first. A C4 plant is one whose photosynthetic pathway makes a four-carbon molecule first. Um, and the isotope signals pick that up, and I'll tell you what it looks like later. Nitrogen tells us about the trophic position of an organism in that community. And then hydrogen or deuterium, I'll use that interchangeably, isotopes, can tell us about the environment. And specifically, they only reflect climatic variables, things like precipitation, 
or temperature, or in some systems can correlate with or elevation as well. Oxygen, on the other hand, is one that I'm gonna be using in the marine along with carbon. In the marine, oxygen is gonna tell us more about the temperature of the water, and the carbon is gonna tell us a variety of, potentially a variety of different things, but we'll hone in on what we're interested in a little bit later. There we are, okay. So what do stable isotope data look like? So I wanted to give some examples real quick of how these data look in an analysis. So when we're thinking about niche ecology, we're gonna be looking at these sort of X, Y plots. And what I want you to notice in this first one is that on each axis, we have an isotope value. So in this first one, it's deuterium. And then on the Y, it's carbon. And on this lower right-hand plot, we have carbon and nitrogen. And so we're learning something about the isotopic niche of these different animals and how they interact with the other animals in that system or with other individuals for a population, how those points sort of lay out in space, the plot space specifically. We might also be interested in learning about an organism's life history or the history across its lifespan. And so in a fish, and this is Pacific cod in particular, not one of mine, but from another study, where they have analyzed along the otolith, essentially the lifespan of this fish, looking at the oxygen isotopes and reconstructing the temperature that it experienced through its life, which is very similar to some of the work that I'm doing now. We might also be interested in asking questions about physiology. So physiology is uh, gonna be reflected in carbon isotopes. Okay, so. We might also want to look into the past in order to help us think more clearly about what types of future, future patterns we'd expect to see. So this is a system that I've worked in, and the animal you're looking at there is a kangaroo rat, and it is a known specialist on the plant that's sitting next to it called atroplex or salt brush. And what's really neat about this little animal is it's two incisors, it's two front teeth, they're shaped like chisels, and it removes that layer of salty tissue off of the top of that plant and then eats the really uh, wet tissue on the inside. Or at least that's what we think. But we want to understand throughout time, has this animal always used this resource? And because it's one of the few C4 plants in the environment that we're interested in, we could go back through time and reconstruct its carbon signals using bone collagen back 8,000 years. And what we found doing this work was that it actually very rarely used those C4 plants. So a diet specialist that's not using C4 plants in this particular context was an interesting finding. And we'll talk more about what that might mean later. But other things that we might be interested in learning about uh, would be the sort of movement patterns of species. And so this is a fur seal in the Antarctic. And what we have on the y-axis is the whisker length. So you take the whisker from this animal and you can measure, you can take samples from the tip to the base of the whisker and learn about the, that time span of that animal's life. And plotting carbon and nitrogen on the y-axis, we see that there are these big shifts in those two isotopes that correspond to movement between these uh, Arctic polar fronts and subtropical convergence regions. That's a really neat thing that we can do with isotopes. So let's think about the system we're gonna start applying these to and the isotopes that we wanna be using. So they're gonna tell us really different stories on land and at sea. Um, so we're gonna start by focusing on the isotopes at land, my carbon, nitrogen, and hydrogen. And just to remind you again, that carbon is reflecting C3 and C4 plants. The nitrogen is capturing our trophic position, how high on the food chain it is. And the deuterium, the hydrogen isotopes are telling us about the climate. So is it warmer and drier, cooler and wetter? And that might correspond to elevation as well. But what kind of system are we gonna ask these questions or apply these isotopes to? Um, turns out in the desert west of North America, the Great Basin is a really excellent study system. I'm gonna tell you why it's a good study system for asking ecology questions and using isotopes. I'm gonna address some of the assumptions uh, of terrestrial stable isotope ecology. And then I'm gonna give you an interesting story about how we can use isotopes to understand competitive interactions and their effect on diet. Uh, 
So the Great Basin is a really unique place for doing ecology of any kind, but community ecology in particular, because it has this cool geographic or geologic history that was the uplifting of this mantle that caused these huge tears in the crust. And then as the mantle and the crust relaxed, it left these north-south trending uh, valleys and mountain ranges that almost can be treated like replicates. And one of the neatest results of this is that it generates high topographic complexity across this entire landscape, which lends itself to increased biodiversity because you have lots of different types of habitats that form in high, to high topographic complexity landscapes, which means that the Great Basin has become a really awesome natural lab laboratory for mammal research over the last century. Those are all the cute critters we're gonna think about. So we can't study all those mountains. We had to pick a couple. And two of the mountain ranges that I worked in were the Ruby Mountains and the Toyabe Mountain Ranges. And key characteristics here, the Rubies are a much cooler, wetter mountain range than the Toyabes. They're much warmer and drier. But importantly, this uh, gradient from warm and dry to cool and wet also exists as you move from low elevation to high elevation in either or any of the mountain ranges in this landscape. So why does that matter for uh, isotopes? Well, we're predominantly interested in looking at carbon and nitrogen isotopes in the animals. And so we need to know if there are gonna be any effects of climate overlaid with the diet information we're interested in. And so we find that it, typically in the literature, we uh, would expect higher nitrogen values to be associated with warmer, drier environments and higher carbon values, or in this case, less negative, because this is all negative down here on this carbon axis. So as we're looking at this plot, carbon on the X and nitrogen on the Y, we see that we could get one of two different kinds of signals here. And we want to know, is this what's going on in these mountain ranges? So if we look at carbon along what's called an aridity index, that's an index of how cool and wet or warm and dry the environment is, we can see two things. But first, to make this really clear, the aridity index at low values is warmer and drier, and at high values is cooler and wetter. And these two ranges have very different, these two mountain ranges have very different ranges of aridity, with the rubies being much cooler and wetter than the Toyabis. Um, and there's essentially no trend in carbon along the aridity gradient in the rubies. And there's a fairly convincing trend in the Toyabis. So what are we gonna do about that? Well, we kind of have to think about what other isotopes we would use. And here we've used deuterium, hydrogen isotopes, to try and understand the uh, overlay of climate and diet variables. So if we look at these two ranges again along their aridity gradients, with deuterium, we find the same pattern in the rubies, that this environment just is so wet uh, and so cool for most of its range that there isn't a trend. But we still have this trend um, with increasing aridity or cooler, wetter areas having these lower deuterium values. And we need to understand if that is going to be reflected in the diets of the animals, or rather the diet signals of the animals from the isotopes. So all the plots so far, and these included, have been points of animal isotopes measured from hair. And what you're looking at on the X is the deuterium, and on the Y is nitrogen and carbon. And we see there's a fairly convincing positive correlation between these sets of isotopes, which makes us think, okay, there must be some overlay of climate in the carbon and nitrogen signals of these animals. And the logical conclusion is they're, they're getting it from the plants because that's what they're eating. And so we needed to look at what the plants' deuterium signals look like. And we're focusing just on the Toyabis now because it was the only one with a gradient anyway. And weirdly enough, the deuterium signal along the aridity gradient in the plants is flat. There's no trend. So we had to figure out, okay, well, what's driving this? And it turns out if you start to really think about the community itself and the different organisms in it, that there might be other patterns going on or other things going on. And so what you're seeing now is the 
carbon, nitrogen, and aridity in this uh, left-hand panel, and carbon, nitrogen, and deuterium in the right-hand panel, um, with the red points being one group of organisms that if we remove from the analysis, we either completely eliminate the trend, so the original trend with those organisms included in all these plots is the dashed line, and without them is the solid black line, and it either reduces or eliminates the trend, and it makes all of the trends non-significant. So what group of organisms might be driving this pattern? Turns out it's these groups of heteromyids, kangaroo rats and pocket mice. And kangaroo rats especially, but pocket mites as well, have extremely powerful kidneys. And when they urinate, it's so concentrated that it actually, the, what little water is left evaporates and it crystallizes on contact with air. But that means that they're keeping as much of their water back in them as they can and artificially enriching those hydrogen signals. And they're driving these trends. But that does give us some really important confidence that maybe the trend we're thinking we were seeing of climate overlaid in diet is something that's accounted for by understanding physiology. So this really gets to the value of checking some of our assumptions when we go into these systems wanting to use isotopes, that local and regional climate may play a role in driving stable isotope ratios, but interspecific variation in physiology can confound that signal, and we should you know, be mindful to inspect it. Okay, so we're gonna switch gears. Now that we have a sense that we can use these isotopes to understand diet and interactions between species, we're gonna think about two organisms in particular that are a really great example of competitive interaction. This larger great basin pocket mouse is known to have antagonistic interactions toward the little pocket mouse when they happen to <laughs> be in uh, sort of the same range, uh, same home range with each other. And they'll actually exclude, the large one will exclude the smaller one from habitat. So it leads us to wanting to sort of understand the system a little better and ask questions about what happens when these species go from being in sympatry, where they have overlapping elevational ranges and distributions uh, and are competing with each other, where the larger organism, species A in this diagram, is excluding the smaller species B from this preferred you know, bush with the little red berries on it. Um, and what's gonna happen if they're no longer in contact? And so the hypothesis is this, that when they're no longer in contact, both animals should be choosing this potentially higher quality resource in contiguous allopatry. So we looked at our system and it turns out that historically, they do have overlapping range, elevational ranges. And unfortunately, what I, you can't see here anymore was there uh, were some abundance bars, but what's important is that they are overlapping and the Open circles are places, all the circles are places that were sampled. Open circles are places where an organism wasn't found. Um, and the closed circles are where the organisms were found. If a circle is flanked on either side, we assume that those organisms do exist at those sites, even though we didn't trap them there. So historically, about 100 years ago, these two organisms had isotopic niches that look like this. And what I want you to notice is that the little pocket mouse is in the larger bubble, uh, and the Great Basin, the big pocket mouse, is in the smaller red circle there. And the two hash marks uh, represent locations where the those individuals were trapped at the same locality. And so we know that they are actually interacting and ex excluding each other from using the same resources. But it turns out, in the modern, their ranges no longer overlap. Their elevational ranges no longer overlap in this mountain range. And the smaller of these two pocket mice, its isotopic niche collapses down into the same space or very similar to the same space as the larger of the two pocket mice. And so this gives us this really cool insight into how these interactions vary across space and time. So, some key lessons from terrestrial uh, isotope ecology are that stabilized isotope analysis can provide really important insights about antagonist, antagonistic interactions. It can enable ecologists to look backwards in time, and it can help us understand how much plasticity individuals or species have uh, in order to 
adapt to changing environments or changing community compositions. Okay, so let's switch gears now and start thinking about marine systems, which is I know why you're all really here, I'm sure. Um, so we're gonna be thinking about the two isotopes, carbon and oxygen in Pacific cod. And I wanna emphasize again here, oxygen is going to tell us about the temperature. And in this first little diagram, oops, my laser pointer, um, this is a stylized version of an otolith. I'll tell you more about that later, but the dark lines, represent winter annuli, and the light areas represent basically the rest of the year when it's warmer. So when the oxygen isotope values are lower, the temperature temperatures will be higher. Carbon, um, we think it can be associated with metabolic rates such that higher carbon values, less negative carbon values, will be associated with lower metabolic rates. So. Navigating the Pacific cod responses to environmental change, we're interested in talking about first how Pacific cod fisheries um, sort of behave during marine heat waves. And then I'm gonna to talk to you a little bit about how we use otoliths and stable isotopes to reconstruct temperature. And then I'm gonna tell you about what we're sort of seeing so far in this work since we're still in the early stages of it. Okay, so first I wanna direct your attention to the map here. So that is in the Gulf of Alaska, and each of those points represents a locality from where one of the samples in our uh, system or in our study have come from, and they're shaded by year uh, from about 1987 capture to 2015. Um, and we're waiting on a few more samples up through 2020. The big graph on the uh, primary y-axis is showing us annual marine heat wave uh, intensity index with year on the Y and the secondary, uh, or year on the X and secondary Y axis is our spawning stock biomass. And I wanna point out a couple of things. First, that we have these sort of three heat wave periods in the early 2000s and then um, 2013 to 16 and 2019, I believe. Someone will correct me if I got that wrong. Um, and so the spawning stock biomass is high prior to marine heat wave periods, um, and then it is declining dramatically during uh, or around these marine heat waves. And Pacific cod in particular are known historically as the fish that go away. Or, uh, and so trying to understand why they go away and where they're going is a key question for us. So how are cod gonna respond to warmer temperatures? So this diagram, I wanna break down first for you a little bit um, and point out a few things. So this has multiple lines on it, a gray line, a black line, and a red line. The red line corresponds to temperature the fish is experiencing uh, as estimated through oxygen isotopes. The black line is metabolism, which we're going to be estimating or trying to understand using carbon isotopes. And the gray line is the annual growth, which is another proxy for body size. So we can break this down a little bit further, though, from these sort of five different predictions into a few key ones. That these first two, the species are going to be tolerating marine heat waves. In this third one, they could be acclimating. And in these last two, they would be moving during marine heat waves. So in the tolerate conditions, we're expecting isotope values to decrease for oxygen and annual growth rates to either remain constant or decrease. If they acclimate, we expect those oxygen isotope values again to decrease during warm periods, reflecting that warmer temperature, but that their annual growth rates increase. So they're actually thriving in that warmer weather. And finally, if they move, we expect that their isotope values are going to either remain constant or increase, reflecting that they've moved to someplace even cooler than where they were. Um, and the, the annual growth rates will either remain constant, so they found a place that was just like home before the heat wave, or that they've decreased, so they've moved to stay cool, but they've sacrificed maybe higher quality diet resources. Okay, so what the heck is an otolith? So an otolith is uh, a also called an ear stone. It's a calcium carbonate based structure that is effectively the ear of the fish. They use it for um, sort of balance in the water. 
And what's really cool about Otoliths, and I'm showing you in this uh, right-hand panel, is a whole bunch of different otoliths from different species, is that they're diagnostic of species. And the one in the blue box is specific cod. Um, and what I want you to notice in these two diagrams is sort of the location of the otolith uh, in the ear and the sac uh, saccular otolith. Um, and that's where it's being formed. Um, and what's valuable to us is that they put on daily growth rings and annual growth that we can see in darker and lighter bands and that they correlate well with body size. So this is one of the otoliths in transverse section from my study. Uh, and the actually not too bad. Um, you can kind of see where the bands, the rings get darker and lighter. And that's what we're trying to focus on is the age of the fish and then analyzing from dark or light to dark, light to dark. So it's gonna look something like this. These are the ages of a, this, of a particular otolith. And we want to remove material in order to analyze it and collect oxygen on the primary y-axis and uh, carbon on the secondary y-axis isotope values along the distance of this. And so when I say distance, I mean distance from edge, this region here at the, what's called the dorsal tip back along this transect. And so when we do that, we start to remove material and get values. And those values correspond to different periods in that animal's life. So if we take that same graph and look at it, and it's a non-heat wave, a fish that lived through non-heat wave years, and we do some math and we convert those oxygen signals into temperatures that the fish experienced, we can look at those four and a half years of life or so uh, from 1993 through 1996 and look at the actual temperatures, the estimated temperatures that fish was experiencing. And what's neat is that we line those years up with this annual marine heat wave index, and they're experiencing temperatures we would expect for a fish living through that time period. So what if we look at a fish that lived through a heat wave? So we have, again, on this primary y-axis, the oxygen isotope values, and they're lower, they're closer to zero, uh, which is different from the previous fish. And when we do the math to convert those to temperatures, we see that instead of five to seven or nine degrees at the top, the heats, the temperatures that this fish experiences are upwards of 12 or almost 13 degrees uh, during the heat wave period. And that's pretty consistent with the window of life for this fish on this heat wave intensity figure. So, if we bring it back to our original predictions, uh, we can look at both the temperature it's experiencing and then the patterns of growth. So this second figure here, I have age on the x-axis. This is the full life of the fish, not just the four years that I looked at in the isotopes. And on the primary axis, it's the full cumulative growth of that uh, otolith. And on the secondary y-axis, it's the annual growth or the growth rate each year. And we see that it gradually declines across the life of this, this fish, which is something that's kind of consistent with what we would expect in sort of normal temperatures and normal life history of this fish. So for a heat wave fish, what we see is that during this year three of life, we start the heat wave experience for this animal and through year four. And in year three, we have pretty high growth rates still but then it drops dramatically into year four that then remains low through five and six. So we're trying to understand how heat wave could be impacting the ability of this organism to get nutrients and continue to grow. And if this change is more rapid than we would expect. Another thing that we'll note, but um, we can talk more about uh, another time if you'd like, is that we often expect a correlation between carbon isotopes and oxygen isotopes in the otolith uh, carbonate. And it turns out across all of the samples that we've looked at, there's a pretty wide range. And these two individuals show kind of the furthest extents that in some animals, this is, there's essentially no correlation between them. 
and in others, there's a really strong positive correlation. And so we're still going to, we have more work to do to understand the relationship between carbon and physiological characteristics of these organisms through their lives. So leveraging isotopes uh, for conservation and management being one of the goals here means that we really need to understand that it's going to help us understand, uh, you know, temperature the cod's experiencing and how that influences the behavior through their lifespans, but also through these marine heat waves, um, whether they're staying or going, um, and if they're more susceptible to decreased growth rates during these periods. Also, changes in metabolic rates or physiological condition could indicate the degree of resilience to climate impacts. So if we find over the course of this work that, in fact, these species are pretty, you know, remain pretty physiologically unperturbed, through the heat wave, it would tell us that that isn't necessarily the main concern. So if they're leaving, it could be driven by something else. Okay. And with that, I want to thank everyone who's here and everyone who viewed online and all the many, many folks that have helped me through both the years of my PhD and have been present for the iterations of this talk and helping me through understanding marine systems as a terrestrial ecology guy. So thank you very much. and. I guess we'll take questions. Thank you so very much. Um, so I want to open it up to questions and I want to start online. Any questions online, Roseanne? Not yet. Okay, so if you are online and you have a question, please put it into the chat box. How about questions in the room? There we go. Great talk. Um, I'm I'm always interested in Pacific cod, and I'm going to start there. But um, yeah, just maybe just commenting on just sort of um, sort of what otoliths you have. It seems seems like right now you're you're getting these otoliths from these more recent heat waves, and just sort of thinking about um, you mentioned really importantly, yes, there's this age dependent growth. But are you considering, I guess, maybe these other interactions about response to temperature at different ages? So maybe there's these other interactions of thermal response at different ages. And um, is is that something that you you think you'll have enough otoliths to sort of tease those things apart? Or will you, you know, are you maybe starting this two-part question about you know, how many otoliths you've got and sort of the, the age range that you have and then um, how far into that? those other questions about those other interactions you could look at? Yeah, uh, great question. So how many otoliths are we actually going to analyze for this project? What are the age, range, age, age ranges of those fish and what years are we analyzing? So we'll have about uh, 150 total otoliths that we analyze. A portion of those, about 40 of them, are going to be coming from uh, actually archaeocytes so that we can look back in time 8,000 years, I think, is the furthest, the deepest in time that we'll get with those. The modern uh, collection of about 100 otoliths is from uh, about 1982 will be the oldest point in time, all the way through 2020 will be the last cat catch date. We've selected fish that were five through seven years old uh, to analyze. So that means that in some of them, I will actually capture part of their eighth year. And we're looking at typically the last three to four years of life. Uh, so we're really looking at the sort of adult cod in the adult life stage. That get all your questions? Yep. Great. All right, questions online. Okay, questions in the room. I'm gonna sneak in front of you too, forgive me. Thanks Dave, uh, that was really interesting. I learned a lot about pocket mouse. Uh, which is fun, um, Great. but I'll but I'll ask a question about cod because uh, <laughs> uh, I don't know enough about pocket mice to ask a question. So um, the question is, uh, we hear, you know, normally when, as a marine ecologist and we start talking about stable isotopes, we're expecting to see the carbon and nitrogen responses. So I'm curious if, you know, there is a nitrogen piece of the story that you are looking at as well and is, or, or is that preserved in the odalis and because of its relationship to diet and trophic level. And if that is part of the thing you're investigating, the potential impacts of that piece of the puzzle on the cod, you know, during the heat wave. 
That's a great question. So are we looking at nitrogen isotopes in our otoliths? And what questions might it help us address for heat wave, you know, Pacific cod responses? So we don't have it written to this grant, partly because when you collect aragonite out of the otolith, it doesn't have nitrogen. Um, the otolith does have the otolin protein structure that is the scaffolding, which would have nitrogen signals, but we would need to decalcify the otolith to retrieve that and then to do those an analyses. Um, because it's not in the current grant, we don't have questions based on it. It is something that could would be interesting to do, um, try and understand another layer of this story, but it's not what we're currently working on. Thank you, though. Other questions in the room? All right. I do. <laughs> I look forward to talking about everything. <laughs> um, I also love cod, but I'm going to ask about the terrestrial ecosystem because I know nothing about it. Yay. Um, can you shed light? So to me, it seems really binary to have like either cold and wet or hot and dry, like why can't you have hot and dry? Sorry, I, that's the one. Why? Can't, <laughs> I'm really tired. Um, why can't you have like hot and wet and cold and dry? As like is, can you like maybe just explain that a little bit more and how the isotopes help you understand that? Yeah, absolutely. So the question being, why not think about hot and wet in it, these systems? Well. The main reason is this, this is the desert system. So we don't have hot and wet in any part of the system. There are systems that are hot and have a lot of precipitation, um, rainforests, for example. And yeah, I think then some of these relationships tend to break down at that sort of that scale. But when you start moving up elevation, you really do see these ecosystem shifts. So even if in your basin of a rainforest, you have these really warm, wet environments, you start moving up the mountain ranges in, let's say, South America, and you're going to start to see these trends reemerge as you move through that. You might also find that as you get really high elevations into like the Atacama or something, where it's cold and dry, but it's not like tundra, you get really different sorts of signals. But then there's also very few organisms living there, so it's harder to ask isotope questions in animals in places where they don't live. So I don't know if I have a great answer. Other than that, we focus on the sort of gradients that we have to measure in the system we're in. Awesome. Thank you. All right. Other questions in the room? All right. Hang on. I guess I have two questions. One, you started out by talking about what a great system the basin, the great basins were. But the two places that you talked about were the mountain ranges. And so I, I understand that it's the basin and range system. So I'm just yeah. want to clarify that that is indeed where you were focused and that's the that it's really the basin and range system that's so great. Is that true? Yes, that's exactly it. Uh Okay. I, I, I just wanted yeah. to make sure I understood correctly. No, Got that's it. that's okay. great. Yeah. The second question is about your slide that showed the decline in cod. And you said decline. I, I thought I understood you say that it was related to the heat waves. And it appeared to me from the graphic that the decline in population, if I'm seeing it correctly, um, occurred largely before that those recent heat waves. Is that true? That Yeah. So we are seeing a decline in that specific line, but we have especially uh, strong drops in this population fought like during these two, these three heat waves um, where the stocks essentially collapse or did they really collapse? Did they, they closed the fisheries though. I know that. I am still new to marine fisheries. And so if Jessica has anything she'd like to add, I would love to leverage her knowledge. No, no, that's great. Yeah, in the longer term, there, there's obviously a decline in the population, but see at the end about 2017, 18, 19, that the almost yeah. the ultimate red one. Yeah, 
Yeah. So estimates of the spawning stock biomass declined by about 75%, and they did completely close the fishery in 2020 for the first time. And whether some of that is fish movement to the north and or death is, is still an outstanding question, although clearly there was high rates of mortality. And that's kind of what spawned, no pun intended, this study <laughs> and, and the idea of understanding what they did, at least those that survived. Yeah, thank you, Jessica, for filling in my gap. All right. Other questions? Can you meet me part way? <laughs> <laughs> All right, Emily made me feel bad about not asking about the mice. So, <laughs> so I guess you know, trying to put the historical puzzle together. Um, I think if I my notes are right, that in the original graph a hundred years ago when they had non-overlapping, yeah. Um, that's when they they co-occurred then? Yeah, so they're co-occurring in this, they, they co-occur on the landscape the whole time, but their elevational distributions are only overlapping during this, you know, this period and earlier. Some point after this period, they, their elevational distributions basically become contiguous, but not overlapping. And so we think they're no, must no longer be having uh, antagonistic interactions with one another, where that larger mouse is actually beating up on the smaller mouse. And there's an interesting piece of work uh, or paper done by Andy Blaustein, who's emeritus faculty in integrative biology, um, where he and a colleague actually captured a bunch of these mice and then observed their interactions in captivity uh, to sort of establish this idea that they are really antagonistic towards one another. Um, and so it was leveraging that as part of our hypothesis that these two organisms might be duking it out for some resource. Uh, right. Yeah, yeah, and and so I guess you know going from that time period to the period where they're no longer sharing the habitat and their isotopic signals look very similar. You know what is what is the other thing that's changed in the environment that has now allowed them to co-occur, and is that is that at all related to the food sources, you know, or, or that prevent them from co-occurring. And so, you know, the other pieces of the puzzle, because, you, you know, because you also mentioned the ability of the animal's physiology to to alter the the ratios, you know, the isotopic ratios you get from the food. So I guess I'm just curious, you know, maybe there are other lines of evidence to support that this change is caused by the their connectivity or the just, or the competitive interference from a preferred food source, which is no longer present versus some other controlling aspect of the food sources when they co-occurred. Yeah. So what other variables or environmental factors might be at hand here? Uh, and there are a few things that are probably sort of acting on the system all at the same time. Uh, in I think 1925, the Taylor Act goes into effect and basically removes livestock from this landscape almost entirely. Um, before that, there was something like 90,000 sheep uh, in this mountain range at any one time, uh, having a really big impact on the environment. Uh, so that might have been constraining the sort of suitable habitat that was available to these organisms. Uh, we also see the increase and spread of uh, the invasive cheatgrass um, across this landscape through that period of time, whether or not that provides a sort of release diet option or not isn't clear because um, the sort of centroid of the isotope signal for the larger of these two, the Great Basin pocket mouse, stays the same place. So they're not likely being explained by the availability of cheatgrass as a new resource because it was pretty abundant in the 1920s and 30s during the first part of this study uh, and is wildly abundant now. So it shouldn't have been a limiting factor. Um, other than that, small changes in community composition and the fact that from the 1920s and 30s through to the 2000s, this environment did get um, warmer and a little bit wetter. It might mean that suitable habitat expanded a bit uh, and meant that they could separate a little bit further because we do have a down uh, elevation expansion in the smaller pocket mouse. So probably would be my explanation. Thank Lots you. of moving pieces for this question. Um, 
I'm curious because we know that what you're able to eat and the diversity of prey items you might be able to consume is largely dictated by size. And there's a clear size difference between these two animals. I'm curious if you would try to account for that at all. Um, and then as a, another somewhat related question is what do you think about competitive superiority? Like is one more abundant than the other? And maybe that has an impact on who might be getting the quote preferred resources? Yeah. So those are good questions. Those are really great questions. So how is abundance of these organisms influencing their competition and how is, uh, their body size influencing what they can eat? Uh, so let's start with the thing that you can't see in this figure because going from Mac to PC, it deleted it. There are relative abundance bars that are hor horizontal at each of those points, and they have similar abundances um, across their ranges. So I wouldn't necessarily expect that. And they're not the only two animals in the system either. They're just the two that we, yeah, right? They're just the two that we know have really antagonistic interactions with one another. Um, so... My intuition, I'll say that, my intuition isn't that it's a density dependence issue. And in terms of like, you know, you, you said their body size, I immediately thought gape limited, but we're not talking about fish, we're talking about small mammals. They're seed eaters, They're both of them are granivores. So it's less can they get the food item into their mouth and how much of it can they get. And when we've trapped the Great Basin pocket mouse, We've always and only ever trapped it around uh, in very specific habitat type around specific plants. Um, and so it's likely that where they're co-occurring, the limitation is those specific habitat resources and the larger of the two just getting really aggressive when they interact. I feel like I've missed something. Is there something more? No, no, totally. Uh, you pointed out a bias that I have for sure and that I deal with predatory fish. And so I'm thinking about like gape size, visual acuity, swimming speed, things like that, that yeah. really matter when you're eating things that move. Yeah. But if you're eating seeds, maybe not so much. Yeah. So yeah. Thanks. They, don't, they don't run away too well. <laughs> nice. Any other questions in the room? Okay. Hang on, Jessica. I've got to get to you. I'm not actually running. <laughs> I just forgot to mention that if you like talking about pocket mice and or warm, dry places, we were going to go to beer one afterwards with um, David and others around five-ish. So if you want to keep talking or just drink, please join us. And eat some grain. It makes sense. <laughs> All right. Uh, any last call for questions? Any questions online? All right, everybody, let's thank our speaker for today one more time. And thank you all for being here. I hope to see you next week when we talk about sex again, which will be great. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you for coming. I appreciate it. Thank you so much. Great, yeah.